So let's now focus in on CLL and tell us about the data that led to the initial approval of abrutinib in CLL. Ibrutinib was initially studied in the relapsed refractory setting in ultra heavily pretreated high risk patients, sort of the patient population who before the advent of this drug and the studies would have died um, very quickly, you know, fludarabine refractory patients, patients who would have been relegated to stem cell transplantation. The drug was incredibly active, was relatively well tolerated, which led to a very prompt approval based on single arm phase two data, relatively small number of patients, less than 100. And then that data, particularly active in patients with deletion 17P, led to the approval of the drug as a first therapy for patients with the deletion 17P. Sort of unprecedented in oncology to have a drug not necessarily studied in a frontline setting, but because it was so active in the relapse refractory setting, it led to a frontline approval because there was nothing even in the frontline which could have done as well for those patients. So are you saying that the approval of the Brutinib in the frontline setting is only for the 17P deletion? Initially. Initially. Oh, so what's changed? So then a, a second study was conducted called, well, there have been several studies conducted. In the relapse refractory setting, there was the phase 1B2 data, and then there was the Resonate trial, which compared Ibrutinib to Ofatumumab, and then there was a Resonate 17 trial, which looked at ibrutinib in 144 patients with deletion 17P positive CLL. That was all the relapse refractory setting. Then in the front line, there was the Resonate 2 trial, which compared ibrutinib to chlorambucil, which was for patients older than 65 who did not and could not have um, had a deletion 17P. And the FDA took that information and then approved ibrutinib for all patients in the front line setting based on the results of the Resonate 2. It was then studied in the relapse refractory setting in the Helios trial, which was BR plus or minus ibrutinib versus placebo, a positive trial. And then has subsequently been studied in three recent trials in the frontline setting, one which was called ECOG 1912, which was FCR versus ibrutinib plus rituximab. That was a positive trial um, for um, ibrutinib rituximab in terms of PFS and OS. An alliance trial which looked at ibrutinib plus or minus rituximab versus bendamustine rituximab which was again positive for progression-free survival for the ibrutinib-treated patients. Interestingly, no difference between ibrutinib and ibrutinib plus rituximab, so the CD20 seemed to add nothing. And most recently, there is a trial called the Illuminate trial, which was again label-enabling, which was ibrutinib plus the glycoengineered anti-CD20 obinutuzumab versus the CLL11 regimen, which was obinutuzumab plus chlorambucil. And there, that was also a positive trial, which then modified the label subsequently allowing ibrutinib plus obinutuzumab to be considered as a front therapy for CLL. Okay, so, but let's come back to that ECOG trial. That was um, FCR versus Ibrut IR. IR. Um, not all patients with CLL are the same. We just um, discussed that. And there is data from, I think, Germany and the MD Anderson that the subpopulation of CLL patients with mutated uh, CLL um, appear to have a plateau on the progression-free survival curve around 50% after FCR chemotherapy. So with that, do we know how continuing therapy for years with IR or ibrutinib alone would compare to FCR? What are you doing in your practice? Yeah, it's a great question. So the data from the Germans, the Italians, the MD Anderson group really suggested that younger patients without a P53 aberration, either by sequencing or by FISH, who were IGHV mutated could go on to have a very long progression-free survival. Agree, there's a tail on the curve, and people say that that's a cure fraction, probably 20% or less of all patients who are treated with FCR. The problem with the data from ECOG is it's just not long enough follow-up to know if there is a tail on the ibrutinib curve. So right now it's a complicated conversation for those 5 or 10% of people who would be FCR ideal candidates. We offer them both options. The ECOG data showed a clear difference for the unmutated patients. The mutated patients, the hazard ratio was like 0.4, favoring ibrutinib over FCR, but it was not statistically significantly different. And if you look at the curves, they actually look pretty similar. Yeah. So I think this, this message with targeted therapies is that there really is two CLLs, mutated and unmutated. And you know we're not talking about other targeted agents today, but across the board, all of the classes seem to ha be similar when you compare them to chemoimmunotherapy in the IGHV mutated patients. And it's, and it's pretty um, evenly divided between mutated and unmutated. Most studies I've seen about 50-50. 50-50, yeah, I'd say like 60-40 unmutated to mutated. So can I come back to the, the testing for that? I mean, because that's sure. specialized testing. You have to do 
sequence analysis and look for deviations from germline. Mm -hmm. That's more than what, 2% of yes. the sequence. Um, before we knew about that, there were other assays that were quite in vogue, uh, ZAP70, CD38, which correlated in some way with the mutational status. Do you think we can rely on those other assays or we should be doing the mutational Personally, analysis? I don't think so. I mean, at one time, these were good surrogates for IGHV mutational status when that was more difficult to obtain. But they're really, they're not perfectly correlated. They're very subjective. You know, ZAP70 is often based on flow cytometry, for example, so you can really have an inaccurate result. You know, if it were up to me, if I were designing a CLL prognostic panel, I would remove CD38 and ZAP70. And when I was at the University of Pennsylvania, I asked them to remove them, because I don't think they provide any information. IGHV mutational testing is available ac at academic centers, through commercial labs. It's pretty much available to everyone. You know, the NCCN recommends it, the IWCLL recommends it. When you look across real world registries, like only five to 7% of patients have it checked before their first therapy. Major, major area where education needs to be um, implemented. You know, where at my former institution, it was as easy as adding an order into the EMR versus a paper requisition, which changed our use of it dramatically. Mm -hmm. It's just that people don't necessarily know how to order it as well, as easily.